I love to hear the sacred tongue, Biblical Hebrew. Whenever we draw near together to worship the Most High God. Oh, how I love to share Biblical Hebrew word study lessons so that we may understand the message of Elohim more clearly. Today, we're going to be studying the Hebrew word kanaf. Before we get started in keeping with Jewish tradition, I'd like to quote from the Talmud. It describes a holy pilgrimage. Rejoicing people going up to worship the Lord Most High is from the Jerusalem Talmud Bikarim, and here's what it says. On the way they were saying, Psalms 122, verse 2, quote, I rejoiced when I was told we shall go to the Eternal's house. In Jerusalem, they said, Psalms 122, 3, our feet were standing in Jerusalem. On the Temple Mount, they said, Psalms 150, verse 1, Hallelujah, praise God in his sanctuary. In the Temple Courtyard, they said, Psalms 150, verse 6, Praise the Eternal, every soul, praise the Eternal. They timed the recitation of Psalms 150 to last from the gate of the Temple Mount to the gate of the Temple Enclosure. The Jerusalem Talmud Bikurim. Let's pray. Alvinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, thank you for thy holy Torah. Thank you for living breath to sing your praise and to read your word aloud. Thank you for the cyclical periods of time that allow for a weekly Shabbat where we can rest in your presence and meditate upon your truth. Thank you for our class today in Beit Talmudim Torah. Please let thy face shine upon each Torah student or disciple of Torah present. And let your face shine upon me also as I teach your sacred word, Lord. Grant us all your grace, and your loving kindness abundantly. In the name of Yeshua Adonai, in the name of Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. And the Hebrew word that we're studying today is kanaf. Its spelling is kaf nun pe. Those are three Hebrew letters. Whenever you see three Hebrew letters through, it's referred to as the Hebrew root word. Oftentimes, you'll see other words that are derived from the original Hebrew root word. So you'll look for those three letters. There are foundational scriptures that we're going to be reviewing in this threefold word study lesson on Kanaf. This is the first of three lessons. And each one of these lessons will have a foundational scripture. So the first one is Hebrew word study number one. It's from Exodus chapter 19, verse four. Now, as we go through the scripture today, I would like for you to open your Bible and follow along. 
So look for Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, or Shemot chapter 19, verse 4. And let's read together. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Let's look at a Bible reference tool. Mountain's Bible Dictionary has this particular entrance for the word wing, for kanaf. The word is found 111 times in the Hebrew Bible, and it reads, quote, extreme part, wing of creatures that fly, corner, hem of garment, ends of the earth, and it says also to see the corner, edge, hem, skirt, species, and wings. These are all different ways this particular word kanaf may be defined as. So let's see if we can find some of these scriptures that mention wings. Go ahead and open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. It's the very first book of Torah. And when we say Torah in Messianic Judaism, or in Judaism at large, we're referring to the first five books of the Bible. And Genesis is a book of origins. It tells us the beginning of everything beginning of how God made the heavens and the earth. It tells the beginning of how God made humanity. That's Genesis chapter 1 verse 21. And it reads, God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that creeps, so that the water swarmed with all kinds of them. And there was every kind of winged bird, and God saw that it was good scripture that we're looking at it lets us know that not only did God make birds and these birds have wings the characteristic of a bird is that it has wings but he said that there was every kind of winged bird and some people might say wing it okay so either is correct so you have in the animal kingdom so to speak variety you have many many species of birds and the Lord wanted to let us know. And when you read, one of the many things I love about the book of Genesis is as it's giving us all these origins, it's defining our surroundings, the life that we have, the world that we live in, the universe. When I was completing my Master of Arts degree and my Master of Divinity degree um, in seminary, like there are some students who may go ahead and write a master thesis, which I did. And when I wrote the thesis, I was describing how the Lord actually takes the word of God. And as you read through it, you'll see that he is describing all these different qualities and characteristics of the things that are around us. It could be light or water or animals, birds insects, weather, you name it, even our humanity. God describes everything about our life. And in so doing, by describing it in minute detail, he's actually, he's actually preserving it. He's sustaining it. So pay attention as you read the Bible. And this is one of the things that I want to teach you to do as you're reading the scriptures. So notice that it says, so in Job, 39 verse 13. Let's take a look at it. Job 39 verse 13. It reads, Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Now, if you've ever seen a peacock, whether like on television or in a picture or maybe at a zoo somewhere, peacocks are a beautiful bird. It has a very interesting wide it's like a circular wings but what is unique is they have what appears to be many many eyes so the scripture describes it as goodly wings and it's saying it's like the lord is speaking to job and he's asking did you give the peacock his goodly or beautiful wings and he says or wings and feathers unto the ostrich wings and feathers. So when we say wings, 
What is character characteristic of a bird? A bird has wings. What is characteristic of a wing? A wing has feathers. Now, it's interesting that this particular bird was chosen because ostrich, they're a very odd bird in that they do not fly. Most birds fly, as you know, but the ostrich doesn't. It can run, but it doesn't fly. And there's some other scriptures that mentions ostrich, which is interesting. Um, they lay their eggs in the sand where someone can step on it, which is mentioned in the scripture, and it's kind of foolish. But uh, so, you know, you have these, even within the, the animal kingdom, you have these, all these characteristics. You have these birds like the, we were, we're looking at the, the eagle, and it's a noble bird, and we'll get more into his characteristics later. But then you have the bird who's not so smart, like the, the ostrich. But anyway, let's look at another scripture. Job 39, verse 26. Here, again, is more details. It says, is it your wisdom that sets the hawk soaring, spreading its wings toward the south? Very interesting. The hawk is one of those birds with a very, very large wingspan. The eagle, the hawk, they have, like when they hold out their wings, it's very, very wide. And as a result, it's able to have this characteristic of being able to soar. The wind will catch the wing of, of these, these, these great big birds and they won't even have to flap their wings up. They can literally just glide or soar at high, high levels. They're very high over the earth. The Bible describes soaring. It also says spreading its wings toward the south. Well, this is interesting. How does the bird know which direction is south? It does. The fact that birds are able to distinguish the fact that we have we have the north and south and the east and the west and so forth, that we live in a, a directional, it's like our existence is defined by these four directions. When I was a child, my parents, they had, they owned property in California and there, there was a literal, literal miniature playhouse in the backyard and it was mine. It was like a literal, it was like a miniature house. And on top of it, it had a, a weather pane and it had the, um, it had the, it showed the four directions. And it was just interesting. There's also, you know, way we can tell our directions. Have you ever seen a compass? A compass has the four directions on it. And just as a point of interest, when I was a child, my mom loved to, my mom of blessed memory also, she loved to uh, give us all kinds of science lessons in the backyard. And she even showed us how you could take, a, you could take a little saucer, put water in it, and then magnetize, like if you have a needle, put it on a magnet for a few minutes, magnetize it, and she showed us how you could drop it in the water and it would literally float and then it would point in this direct in the direction of the north. Well, birds, they navigate. Their navigational system is based on directions, east, west, north, and south. And here the scripture shows it, spreading its wings toward the south. Excellent. So these details I find it very beautiful. When I read the scripture, I am looking at the details of all that God is teaching us and how beautiful it is that he shows us more about our own world, about our own life. He who knows us because he made us. He who made all things. So always pay attention. Read the scriptures carefully and prayerfully. Ask the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, when you're doing a word study. Like right now, we're doing a word study. And I'm, I'm teaching you how to pay attention to what the scripture is showing you because a lot of people just read all these things and not think anything of it unless you've been shown to look at these details because the Bible has given you a lot of information. Oh, I want to make my own compass. Well, because of my mom, I know how. And these, I mean, and why? You know, just because she felt important to teach us about science and teach us about life. 
Well, the Bible teaches us about life in the greatest way on how to live, not only for this life that we're in now, but also in the world to come. Okay, now let's go on to another scripture. Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 3. Again, that's Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 3. And it reads, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came into Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. Okay, so here's some more characteristics. It describes a great eagle. And I find it interesting that there are many different types of eagles. So this one is defining it as a great one. So it was a very large one and it had great wings. And it describes how the wings are, how the wings was as far as long winged, um, full of feathers. And the fact that it had many different colors. And then it also describes how it took the highest branch of the cedar. One of the characteristics of, of the eagle is that it likes to um, nest, make its nest very high, high elevation in trees or like in a mountain or so forth. And here we have a scripture describing these details. Okay, now here is my favorite verse. So I'm speaking about eagles and wings. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. And most likely... You may have heard it before. It's a favorite verse of many people. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. I love this scripture because the Lord knows how difficult life is. Everyday life can be wearisome. And the Lord knows that sometimes we need to be refreshed. We need to be renewed. So it lets us know that if we'll wait upon the Lord, we'll, it's like we'll find our strength being renewed. And then we'll be able to mount up with wings as eagles. And it, it shows that we can rise up from a time of weariness, a time of being fatigued and so forth, God gives us this blessed gift of rest. And if you're watching this broadcast on a Shabbat, then you know the value of how wonderful it is that to rest every seven days. In fact, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And um, because of it, we're able to rest. Now, so here we are. We've just described all these different types of birds and things. I think it's beautiful to be able to, how many times on a clear day, we look into the blue skies and we see birds soaring. If you're in an area, some areas might have more birds than other, more species. Like in the city, you might see a lot of pigeons or sparrows. Um, you might see seagulls if you're near the coastline. You might see, if you're in a forested area, you might see, um, like let's say, robins and larks and all different types of birds. And if you're into ornithology, which is the study of bird, birds, then you know these various species. And even like subspecies, there's great variety in nature that God made. Well, it all started in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, I'd like for you to go ahead and let's, let, let's look at Genesis chapter 1, 26. Because here it's showing us the basic categories of all these creatures that God made, including humanity. And it's interesting how many times when people quote the scripture, they stop after the creation of humanity. But this one verse is describing all the things that God made on earth. So it reads, And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. So over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So sometimes people will say, okay, God made the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, and the beast of the field, or the cattle of the field, and they stop right there. 
But uh, this mentions that God also made every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And I remember a pastor once saying he, he threw this last part in there because, well, it was necessary to describe you know, where insects came from, bugs and insects, the creepy crawlers, those things that we don't want in our house, of course. Well, God made those too, and it's all covered, everything in this one text. Now, when he chose, what I, what I like when I read the scriptures, how he chose a bird, how he chose an eagle to describe how he brought Israel out of Egypt. And there must be a reason why he chose a bird even more specifically why he chose an eagle with his, his beautiful wings. There had to be a reason. And if you ever have taken a freshman college class, like let's say in anthropology, as I did many years ago, it was taught that out of, out of all the creatures on earth, only humans and birds are bipedal. That is, we both walk upright with our feet. Interesting. Someone else also pointed out to me that an eagle has legs like the hairy legs of a man. Eagles are considered to be majestic, noble, beautiful, strong. They fly to exceedingly high heights. Their vision is acute. They can see objects far, far distances away. They build their nests high from the ground. They teach their young to fly in such a way so that when the little eaglets, if they fall, it's like the mother eagle swoops underneath it very swiftly and she doesn't allow it to hit the ground. It reminds me of Israel. Like a fledgling little bird, the newly freed nation left Egypt. Yet instead of taking the route that would lead to safety, Moses is led by the Lord to what appears to be like a, a, a he comes to a just a dead end. It seems like it's going to be a dead end because the Egyptian army is behind them and they're going to they're ready to attack them. So behind them is the Egyptian army, in front of them is the Red Sea. They had no place to go. There was no place they could go at all. So what did Abenenu do? What did our Lord do? He parted the water, and Israel walked safely across on dry ground. The Lord brought Israel to himself on wings of eagles. Let's remember it's at Mount Sinai where Moses received the Torah those first five books of the Bible that we read through each year during our Shabbat service. It's at Mount Sinai where God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on the two stone tablets. The Ten Commandments contains the quintessential laws necessary for societies and individuals, even the world itself, to function and to thrive. It has laws such as Worship God alone. Don't worship idols. Honor your parents. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet, etc. Now, listening to all these things about what happened with Israel and Mount Sinai, you might say, well, that's fine and dandy for Israel. But what about my life here and my life now? Well, because Mount Sinai it had these very important truths, these laws, and what we gained from these laws and from Israel being at Mount Sinai and the revelation that was given to Moses and to Israel is that we gained humanity all of the, as a result. All of humanity was able to gain an understanding of the true nature of who God is. We were able to receive the Bible because Jewish people wrote the Bible. We were able to receive the Messiah himself because he was birthed 
from Israel. He came from specifically from Judah, the tribe of Judah. Our entire understanding of God Almighty and Western civilization, civilization itself is predicated on the fact that the Lord God safely brought Israel to that mountain against all odds. Now, let me ask you a few questions. Have you been stuck in front of a literal Red Sea lately with the, red, the enemy ready to do you in completely like they were? I doubt it. Those fancy chariots with six spokes in the wheels were considered to be the most advanced military technology of their day. Egypt was so advanced with its culture, its literature, its architecture, its medicine, its military science, that even to this day, we're able to see, let's say we see the, the pyramids. Yet despite the grandeur and the greatness it achieved, Pharaoh and Egypt and the armies of Egypt were no match for Almighty God. No match whatsoever. God brought Israel to himself on wings of eagles. This particular truth is commemorated every year when we celebrate Pesach or our Passover Seder, which we are going to have next month. Now, I'd like for you to think about whether you've ever experienced a time where it looked like the bottom was about to fall out, but it didn't. For example, perhaps you were healed from a major illness or you received unexpected funds just in time during a financial emergency. Maybe you were hired into a position that you would have never believed possible or you received a much needed promotion. In the midst of all these scenarios, the Lord was lovingly carrying and holding you, leading you by his spirit to bring you to where you are. Right now, hearing these very words, the Lord was lovingly upholding you upon his wings. He loves all his people, not only Israel, but also he loves us now. He did not let you fall, just like the eagle does not allow its eaglets to fall, but swoops underneath and catches the young. Yeshua did not abandon you. The Lord lifted you up and help you to continue your life's journey. Today, you are able to enjoy your family and friends, your employment or business, your hobbies and pastimes, your travels and adventures, all because of his faithfulness to you. Yes, you may have faced difficult times or you may be facing difficult situations today. This is something that all of us have, have been through or are going through. Hasatan, the, or the devil, the arch enemy of our soul, has been, might have been trying to throw many punches in your directions lately. And if he has been doing this, just remember the example of what God did for Israel in the Red Sea. Also remember what the ancient psalmist wrote many years ago. He said in Psalms 31, verse 15, My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from them that persecute me. The Lord is able to deliver us from anything Hasatan tries to throw at us. These, all these, these metaphoric pictures of us being held lovingly in the hands of the Lord or underneath his wings, they're in the scripture so that we can understand the protective nature of God. He loves us as his family and he protects and he watches over us. And these, are, these pictures are to help us understand that kind of love that he has for us. Now, if you need salvation today, because you haven't, you don't understand such a relationship, you've never known God personally, then I'd like for you to just watch the video and it'll come to a screen and it'll show uh, they'll have a prayer for salvation. 
where you can invite Yeshua into your heart, into your life, and experience what we refer to as a new birth. In other words, you'll be able to enter into a relationship with the Lord. And just go ahead and read the information on the screen. It will explain everything for you. You'll be able to enter into a faith. And this is where, or it's where a beautiful relationship with your Heavenly Father begins. And you can become His very own child. As a son or a daughter of the Lord, just as all of us who are in faith, we belong to the Lord. We're one family. We're in the family of God. And I'd like to welcome you into the family of God if you'll go ahead and receive the Lord into your life today. Let's close with a reading from our foundational scripture, the one that we read earlier. Exodus 19.4. And now when I read this scripture, think about the things we learned today. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Let's pray. Father God, thank you today. Thank you for introducing myself to Israel and Moses at Mount Sinai. Thank you for giving us the Holy Torah. Thank you for upholding us every day of our life. And thank you for the future day to come when we shall be quickly raptured up or taken up into your kingdom at the second coming of Yeshua, of Jesus. In thy name we pray. Amen. Shalom.